and today we're going to be reading Diary of Wimpy Kid Greg and the Mafia. So yeah, this is a very long fan fiction. I believe it's like 130 pages long, and it took me a while to read. So if you guys want to support me, it's absolutely free. You just hit that subscribe button and like the video. And if you like Wimpy Kid, then you're going to be subscribing to the right channel because I do weekly Wimpy Kid videos, uh, including fan fictions and more. So yeah, let's get straight into it with Greg and the Mafia. Get some snacks ready. Let's go. June, Tuesday. Hi, I'm Greg Hafley. I've just moved into this new hood called Plainview. This, play ain't bad. this place ain't bad according to my mom, but she also recently came out as a flat earther, so her opinion right now isn't really something I should take as valid. I don't even know what my dad sees in her. She's always been a nut, and doing crap like this wasn't really out of her scope. The government watches you poop. My dad's a recovering drunk and found a job here involving a clothing factory. Minimum wage would have been a dream for him. The guy ended up putting us in debt for investing in crap, and I've always used him as a bar that I should never fall down to. You better not search up furry on the computer. My brother Roderick died last month in an assassin assassination at my school. He never found the body. The assassin was my adopted brother, Manny. He recently came out as a member of the Al-Qaeda. His initiation was to kill my brother. That bastard's one of the reasons we left our old town. The witnesses said that his war chant was the most disturbing thing that they ever heard in their lives. Die, ploopies, die. Scream. <laughs> Wednesday. We finally finished moving what furniture we had into our new house, so I decided to go and make friends with the other kids. The house next to ours, I met and meet this kid called Rowley Jefferson. The kid was loaded, and I knew from the fact alone that this would be a beautiful friendship. Huh? Are you gay? What? Hell though, but do you want to be friends? Not as much as before. All the kids, other kids were complete weirdos. Most of them were part of a singular gang called the Active Intelligent Dude Society. If their re re leader, Fragley, was what I heard Rowley was the, the from, was what I heard from Rowley the most terrifyingly sexy man on the planet, and was feared by all in plain view. His name alone made adults crap, and yeah, I can't say that on YouTube, but do something in their pants. Monday. Not one week has passed since we got here and Dad has already gotten himself fired for coming to work drunk and crapping on his boss's desk. To make matters worse, his bo the boss threatened him with saying that if he ever applied to other factories, he'd send Fragley's gang to correct him. Get the hell out, Frank. Mum won't even attempt to get a job. She said that jobs are a way for the government to trick people into falling in line with their evil plot. That, was a, even, that wasn't even the dumbest government-related thing she told me today. The Jews caused 9-11. You heard it here fo first, folks. My parents were now both unemployed, and we didn't have that much money to begin with. I asked Rally how much longer we'd ha we had until we get evicted. He was good with that stuff. And he said that we didn't have enough money to last us to the end of June. At this point, I realized I had to get my hands dirty and start my own business. Do you want to start an epic-style business? Prostitution? <laughs> he agreed to help fund my new business because there was no way he'd just give me m the money flat out. He said that we, he we wanted me to earn my money. He expected a 50% share in the business. Bastard's going to get what's coming to him, but not yet. I still need that ploopy. We decided that our business would supply lemonade to those who crave the thirst. Tuesday. Today, we started selling our lemonade. We were almost out of stock in the first half hour before, because people today were MOIST. It was in all caps. From sweating in the summer heat. People were lining up all the way from the town marijuana store, which made th made getting away with charging extra a little easier. Things were almost perfect. I say it almost because of Rowley. Rowley just stayed inside and watched TV. His excuse was that he was supervising me. 50% for sitting on his fat ass. Can I get a discount if there's semen in the cup, man? Eventually, we ran out of lemons, and I asked Rowley if he could get some more since he didn't do anything. We said that he'd just give me the money while I go get the supplies from the supermarket that was literally 50 miles away. He told me that I could just get my dad to drive me there, but my mom wouldn't let us even won't even let us get a car. I once got uh you guys could read that for yourself. Um you just just I, I I'm not gonna say that on YouTube, I'm sorry. So I ended up using my small amount of earnings to get a ride on the bus. But on the way back I realized that this bus stopped the bus stopped serving early today. I was just about to throw a fit when an old man in the car yelled at me, Get in. At first, I thought this seemed like a beginning of an Law and Order episode, but well, screw it. The old man asked me where I lived so he could drop me off. I realized this guy might not be the most trustworthy guy, so I told Rowley's address instead of mine. On our way there, he told me that he saw me selling lemonade and how it, that it seemed to him that I was doing all the heavy lifting. I explained to him my situation and how I was doing all the heavy lifting. 
and I need how I need to rally to fund their lemonade stand. The old man said that I was smart. Only that he was part of the Chinese mafia, and he'd happy to he'd be happy to endorse my stand and off rally for me. Hmm. We'd even take care of the body. I didn't know if I should get involved with the mafia, let alone the Chinese mafia. What are you implying there, Greg? Yeah, before I could come up with a decision, we had a, we had arrived at Rowley's house. The old man told me to think about his offer. But before he left, he warned me that I should lo look out for copycat stands that would try and steal my business away. With that, he drove away. I don't think that's going to happen, though. No one is that stupid to try and compete with us. Wednesday. Sure enough, the old fool was right, because right across the street, another lemonade stand opened, and they looked like they meant business. The other stand sold all the customers away from us with their virgin-looking stand. It must have been fragly, because some of the goons were hanging around, and they didn't look like they were in the mood for buying any lemonade. My suspicions were confirmed when some kid tried to steal some lemonade, and before he could get five feet away from the stand, the goons tackled him and took him behind a house. I haven't seen him since, and I don't think those guys were giving you any lollipops. Ready to die? It was just lemonade. Well, your ass is about to get nay nay. <laughs> Later, I found the old man by the weed store having a smoke. He told me he knew I'd come back. He asked me what the situation was with the goon stand. I told him that I thought it was time for me to start working with the mafia. The old man told me I wasn't making a mistake. But as we were shaking hands, some goons spot us, and they started talking amongst themselves. I asked the old man if I should worry about that, but he said they were just gang goons. Boy, was he wrong. Last night, as I was getting for bed, I saw a big white van pull up at our house. Two big guys stepped out, pointing rocket launchers at my house. I was gonna freaking die. I quickly grabbed all my money in this journal and jumped out of the single-story window. Yeah, I, I don't think his parents are, are alive anymore. When I got to my feet, I had only seconds to see my room and then my I I had only seconds to see my mom and dad try to escape. My mom missing an arm, my dad missing his <laughs> his penis. What the hell? How does that even happen? Like, okay, the second ro rocket was fired. I don't think I even have enough red ink to describe you the deadly scene. Mm -hmm. Thursday. Today, when the firefighters recovered my parents' bodies, they asked me what started the fire. I told them my parents left the stove on and lit a match to look for what the smell was at night. I guess you could say it was pretty lit. Your parents are dead, you little crap. When they finished up, Rowley came over looking like a fat ass and asked me why the hell I wasn't working. When I told him my family, when I told him my fa uh, when I told him my family. Okay, he said that they were just holding back or some b holding me back or some BS. Or at least that I could live in his basement, but that he'd have to charge our contract with him now getting 95 and me now getting 5%. I'm really going to enjoy killing that Adam mate ton of fun. When I went down to our trash lemonade stand, I found a white box with a note on it. Hello, Gregory. Here's a little something to boost sales. P.S. Put the shirt on. We'll make you look sexy. From old man. I opened up the, blo the box and I couldn't believe my eyes. It was a sexy, black, edgy black shirt. I think about I think about a pound a pound of pure cocaine. I covered up the box to make sure no one was looking at it, and took it to the basement and slammed it shut. I got a pitcher of lemonade and mixed the stuff in. It looked the same, so I knew I was in the clear. Greg, why does lemonade lemonade taste like pain? Uh, I mixed it with love. But when I started selling lemonade, business was booming again. A jogger tasted my lemonade, and I heard the guy jog two towns over. Business is good. Too good. Too good for the goons on the other side to handle. One of them came over and threatened to make me stop selling lemonade. You better stop. You better stop frickin' your sister. <laughs> Gee, Greg, I think you got him there. Later, I told Old Man about what happened today, and I asked if he could help me out. He said that he knew a guy who worked as a bodyguard for real cheap. He goes by the name of Albert. Albert Sandy. I feel like it would make more sense if he went by Sandy. Albert Sandy. That would have sounded cooler. He sounds like a prick. Around 10 p.m., I stuck out of the basement to find Albert Sandy. Sure enough, he was where old man said he'd be. Hey, kid, you got a job for me? I'm searching for a 200-pound 15-year-old to work for me. Yes, I have a job for you. Friday. Today, I set up Albert Sandy next to my sand. He asked me where I was putting lemonade. I said I set that ploopy straight. What I was putting in my lemonade, sorry. You know, did you know that a micropenis is the reason why you're still a virgin? Did you know lemonade's made of lemons? I started selling my secret ingredient lemonade for a while, so one of the goons came to our stand, told me that I better take down my stand, or else. Then Albert Sandy chimed in. Hey, you better beat her, die. Greg heftily clarifies that, the, that the, is it, this is a journal, not a diary. He then explains that he not only agreed to write in one for when he's rich and famous, and for now, I'm stuck in middle school with a bunch of morons, 
Then Den Greg discussed the cheese. I after Sandy started spitting facts at the goons. Some of them were so mind boggling that I had to cover my ears so just so I didn't get knowledge aids. Sure enough, it worked, and that goon was so scared that he ran away, tripping over himself. Albert Sandy has officially saved my business. Saturday. Albert Sandy has officially ruined our business. You remember how well Albert Sandy scared that goon off yesterday? Well, today that guy brought back up. <laughs> oh, well, goodness, this next page. They all came over to our stand with bats and brass knuckles. Albert Sandy yelled at them to stop or else he'll rip the facts into their skulls. They didn't ignore them and kept coming. Albert Sandy then took out an AK-47 labeled the facts and mowed them all down. When the guys at the other stand saw what happened, they took what money they had left and booked it. Albert Sandy then took a grenade out and yeeted it at the stand. One of the goons on the ground was still alive. He said with his dying breath that they were gonna, they were as good as dead and that Fragley would eat our ass. Joke's on him, I have herpes. Joke's on you, so does he. That's pretty badass. We started hearing sirens in the distance, so we took what money we had and made tracks. I didn't bother telling Raleigh about the cops. I hope he has fun explaining to them why there's cocaine in the lemonade. It was around 8 p.m. when me and Albert finally made our way into town. We took a shelter in an alleyway next to a dumpster. I thought we were on the clear till Albert decided to pull a dirty move. Give me the money, Greg. I knew you were a prick. I asked the bastard why you'd betray me at a time like this. He went on how he was going to use the money to purchase a Bertama damn yogurt. He was going to pull it in the trigger, but then he appeared. Uh-oh, fragly. The next thing I knew, Albert had his brain. Uh, Albert got his brains blasted and was being hit on the head by another goon. I woke up with a sack over my head. I was on my knees with my hands tied behind my back. I could hear men talking to each other, probably deciding what to do with me. When I took their sack off the face, I had to bear witness to the most sexy man on this damn earth, Fragley. Hello, Greg. I've heard much about you. Fragley walked up to me and went on how, about how he was not happy to hear that his men were being slaughtered on the streets like dogs. He said that he knew my involvement with the Chinese Mafia and how they had been warring factions for years now. He took off the sack to the man in front of me, and it was Old Man. Hey, prepubescent brat. I begged Fragley not to kill Old Man. Not because I cared about him, but because I didn't want another person dying because of me, like my parents. He just laughed and said that he wasn't going to kill him. He had other people to do that for him, and yeah, he's dead now. I could taste his damn gray matter as I write this. The goon's old man body oh, threw, took old, man body, old man's body away, and it was just me and this other guy left. At first, I thought it could have been anyone in that sack, until I noticed their fat ass. Rowley. Bradley removed his sack and then went on about how he was going to kill the closest thing I had to family, my master. At first, I thought he was joking, but then he whipped out his iPhone X. He opened up Facebook and showed me Rowley's account. He had at least 50 pictures of me naked. There was pictures of me getting dressed and using the bathroom on his account. And then captions all read, my virgin slave taking a crap, or my slave getting to read, ready to be my bitch. That edgy bastard started laughing. He said that if Fragley hadn't tied me up, that he would have. On his bed. That fricker. Fragley put the gun to Rowley's back and he stopped laughing, but before he pulled the trigger, he asked me if I wanted Rowley to live or die. Rowley started, how, started yelling how he had saved my life and then taken me, when, me in when no one else would or some BS. Shut up and die, you st std ridden ploofy. That's a colorful dictionary, Hefley. Fragley smiled and shot my goddamn liver. Bang. Rowley stood up and laughed. I realized that his hands were actually never tied. He looked up to Fragley and kissed him on the lips, and his gay ass started explaining how he and Fragley were a couple of ploopies this whole time. He then gave Fragley another gay ass kiss and took his gun. Get ready to zooey mama in hell. This phrase still makes me shudder as I write this, but just as Rowley's about to blow my brains out, his damn chest blew open. My prince! Rowley fri frickin' died, and the intruders were packing heat. I don't think Greg knows what packing heat means, but okay. Fragley orders goons to fire at him. It was none other than the Chinese Mafia. They swooped in behind boxes, shooting drum guns from Fortnite at the goons with Glocks. You could tell who won that firefight. Glocks are for pussies. At first I noticed that they were, I thought they were here for me. I wish. And I noticed some of them were busting over in crates and for some stuff inside them, which looked like drugs. It was a damn raid. As bullets were streaming across my head, I tried showing them that I was in the Chinese Mafia by showing off my edgy black shirt. But they all ignored me and went for the drugs. I then told him I knew who Old Man was, which got one of their attentions. The guy asked me if I knew where he was. I told him if he held, I'd tell him. Before blacking out, I noticed Rowley's corpse was looking as fat as ever. Sunday. I woke up in a bed with stitches on my gut. The legs and hands were strapped to the bed. At the foot of the bed sat a Portugal, Portugal 
guy with an afro. Not the first thing that comes to mind when I think Chinese mafia. He said that his name was Alex Aruda, and that old man meant missing Friday. He put a gun to my head and told me to start talking. I explained to him how I knew old man that he was killed minutes before they arrived. Well, I ain't Al Capone. Hold up, are you Greg Hefley? Alex went on about how old man spoke highly of me and how he could use someone with my salesman skills to work with drug dealing skills. But before he went on, I asked him if they were able to kill Fred last night. He shook his head and said that he got away. It wasn't the first time they almost got him. When I get my hands on Fregley, he's dead. Alex Aruda ordered a couple guys to let me go from the bed. He then led me through his huge estate. He told me that they worked for a triad that stationed all the way back in China. Apparently there were guys who get them to sell, stuff to sell. Originally, this group consisted of mostly Chinese guys, but when the crackdown of organized crime, then the rise of numbers in the active intelligence due society gang, they decided to hire other kind of people. He led me to the basement of the manor. There was a guy kneeling on the ground with a sack over his face. Alex Aruda ordered a guy to take their sack off. The guy was had a black eye and was gagged. Okay. Alex told me that his guy was the driver from last night, and it was his fault that old man died. Through my allegiance, he gave me the gun and told me to kill him. Ah, oh, jeez, oh frick, I've never killed someone before. I've seen a lot of the old die, but I've never pulled the trigger. One of the goons flashed his gun at me. I yes, saw it was either this guy or me. I think you know which one I picked. Bang, bang, bang. It's out of a gun. I missed between the eyes and shot his gut. I had to put in a few more bullets to, in him to get him to die. The gun felt heavy. Alex Aruda patted me on the back and and introduced me to my new partners, Tyson Sanders. Tyson Sanders is the guy who killed Rally. Who's that, a prostitute? Oh, thanks for killing Rally. I think he has enough holes to now qualify as one. After I met Tyson, Alex Aruda led me to a car. Inside was a suitcase full of money. Alex Aruda told me that I was gonna meet that I was to meet a couple goombas by Elmer's Street in the alleyway. I gave Tyson Sanders the keys, of which I have just found out the real name of a Thompson. He let me keep the M9 that he gave. He also told me to use my skills to lower the price as much as possible. The cheaper we bought the stuff for, the better. With that, he told us to get on with it. The truck he, he gave us was a piece of crap pickup truck from the 90s. Tyson Sanders didn't seem to mind, so I didn't fetch it. At least it wasn't a pretentious Toyota Prius. Dude, Greg is preaching. We drove by a rough-looking neighborhood and stopped next to an old-looking motel. We parked there and headed to Elmer Street and found the rendezvous point, just like Alex had said there were a couple of Goombas they were waiting for us. They greeted themselves as Jury and Chad. Hey, Chad's a cool name. Thanks. All my friends call me Rad Chad. Okay, Rad Chad. So my friends called me that kid. The jury kid looked around, and then I noticed a couple of people down the road and said that we could go somewhere more private. He led us to the motel and pulled out a key to one of the rooms. He opened it up and told us to come inside. Tyson Sanders told me that he would wait outside till I finished up with these guys. The instant I closed the door, this happened. All right, let's get some crap straight. And he has a gun to his head. Okay. Chad said that he had heard about how I was the one who killed all those people on the streets and that they didn't think I, they could trust me. I tried to explain to them that it was Albert Sandy who iced all those goons, but those retards didn't want to hear it. I tried proving to them that it was sane by throwing a gun I had onto the bed. It worked, and the Chad guy lowered his gun. Thanks, Rad. Don't make me change my mind. With that out of the way, we got to business. The jury guy put his bag on the bed and opened up to reveal what looked like two pounds of coke. They told me they wanted $2,000 for it. I opened up the briefcase before I gave it to them. I used my amazing gift to barter them the price to 1000 using my amazing charisma and obvious charm. I almost got away with it. If that jury hadn't realized he, if that jury guy hadn't realized he got swindled, instead of shooting my brains out, he turned turned out. He said he could use a guy like me for the Italian mafia. The jury guy said he could use a guy with me, like a guy like me, with my natural talent, and my instinct to kill. I was about to try and to correct him again, but I, I wanted to see where he was going. He asked me why I should, why I should, why I have to go and risk my dumb ass to go out and buy crap for a couple of goons in Asia. I thought about it, and when he, I, and then I remembered old man and how he would have written, how he would have wanted me to stay with the Chinese. So I declined for now at least. Sure, you get a fifty percent restaurant, fifty percent discount at every Italian restaurant if you join. Friday. It's been about a week since I had my deal with those goombas. I won't lie, I've been thinking about joining the Italians. That shit Alex Aruda makes me do has kind of been getting out of hand, even though every drug deal I've been a part of has been smooth sailing. Except for one. I was doing business with a couple of goons when one of them mentioned Fragley. I pinned the bastard on the wall with a gun in his mouth and the man to know. Where the hell is Fragley? Those mios men, he's in El Carlo, he's in the car. 
I beat the bastard in the head with the gun and ran up to the car. Fragley's ass was mine. Finally, the guy who's caused everything horrible in my life ever since I got here. My parents dying, killing my closet, the closest thing to a mentor, destroying my damn house. I shot the door handle and got ready to kill Fragley. Then I realized, oh crap. Eat a big one, Greg. Love, Fragley. It was a damn setup. Damn it, I still didn't know how those goons knew that I would be the more I would be the moron sent out here. I tried to figure it out until I realized what happens when you shoot a gun in public. Woo get, get in, they called the cops. Oh, I thought I should stick around. You know that a sarcastic attitude isn't really good, Greg. I don't think that's really nice to Tyson, you should apologize. But Tyson wasn't wrong, and the boys in blue were on their our ass in less than two minutes. Tyson Sanders started braiding me for using a gun in the open like that. I told him that they said Fraley was in the car and that he, we could have gotten the but he didn't want to hear it. I think he was more focused on getting away from the cops. Tyson tried maneuvering around the streets where we couldn't shake those damn cops. Tyson yelled at me to take the wheel. He prepared to make crap real with his Thompson. Tyson opened up the window and made the situation go from one to a hundred. You should be at the cops at any more and you got close to us. Might have caused some unintended homicide. What's the kid gonna do? Tell their parents? Tyson shot out one of their tires. Another bullet hit a cop right in the chest. They were packing some heat, too, though, and one of the bullets hit a tire. I tried getting off on the highway, but I think it was five miles down the road, and I don't think Tyson could hold them off for that long. We were surrounded by... We were coming up on the highway, and we passed this huge lake surrounded by trees. We, Tyson yelled at me to swerve into the pass on his signal. First, I thought he wanted to commit suicide, which at this point I was kind of open to. Tyson Sanders got carried away with shooting, and he got hit. Ah... Uh, Tyson lost his gun under the wheels of the police car. He rolled up the window and told me to take a bright at the next intersection. I did just that, but according to a sign, it said that this was a state park. I didn't stop to ask questions and went with it. Meanwhile, Tyson got on the phone with some guy as he pulled into the booth. Hey, we work for Mr. Aruda. Oh, I see. Just like that, they let us in. No questions asked. Tyson sped off and said that the park might be owned by the state, but the people who work there are all uh, so associated with the Chinese mafia. The booth guy gave us ten minutes. Tyson drove the truck into a path far from any buildings or trails, and it was lit littered with trees. He got out and opened the tailgate, side with two sacks. Tyson put on some latex gloves he had in the back seat and gave me what looked like a car bomb. He said to put it under the car, he took out the remote and for, for it and a shotgun. Suddenly I realized exactly what was in those sacks. Live bodies. I could still smell those corpses. He later told me that those guys were part of a frag, a Fragley's gag that I have, and then and had them around in case something like this were to happen. In other words, he had them around in case we needed to fake a suicide. He's good. I'll give him that. When I finished placing the bombs, I got a good look at the goons. Both of their faces were unrecognizable, especially the guy Tyson shot under the chin. I couldn't find his jaw. I don't want to find it. It was too much. Tyson yelled at me to get away from the car and get in the bushes. We hid there for a while until the cops showed up and got a good look at the bodies. One of them threw up. It took me all my willpower not to do the same. I thought we were just going to leave him like that, but Tyson had other plans. To have me blew them up. To make one of those matters worse, Tyson knows that I didn't enjoy seeing all those guys die. He took me, he gave me a stern talking to. Remember, Greg, those cops are dead because you screwed up. I don't want to admit it, but I think I'm obsessed with Fragley. Saturday. Tyson didn't tell Alex Aruda what happened yesterday, which I'm grateful for. But I also kind of felt feel bad for what I've been doing in the past week. You see, I've been borrowing some of the Mafia's money to help out the Italians. I've also been dealing for them, which I guess I'm also not proud of. I've been able to hire some goons to work for me. And now I don't even have to go out on the field to do the dirty work. You know, I'm just glad things are finally going my way. Sunday. Holy crap, I just killed a guy. I like I know I, that I killed the other guy, but I was forced to kill that guy. This time it's because I wanted to. The weird thing, I didn't even know this guy, but I enjoyed killing him. I wonder how it would feel to kill someone who's done me wrong. Monday. Today is especially. You know why? Because today I get my vengeance on a particular man. The man who was the, not the reason, one of the reasons why I'm in the danger zone and an orphan. Not Fraley, however. He'll get his name. No, I gotta kill my dad's boss, Stan Warren. Warren is the big boss of all the companies in this town due to this place being the only town to amend the Sherman and Trust Act back in 1890. I don't even know what, I don't even know how that one happened. Which means he's gonna get the whole, he got one, the whole town in the monopoly. He has the money to pay off any copper politician. Worst of all, he's got Frank Lee's gang to act as a secret service. However, recently a local businessman has been rising above the ranks and according to Alex Ruda, if Warren dies, then this new guy takes his place. The best part being, he works for us. Once I am contro in control, I should re-legalize prostitution for furries, just as we agreed to. Unfortunately, Alex Aruda entrusted the assassination to some goon called Maddox. I'll make sure to get him out of the way. 
It's a good thing Maddox is easily persuaded by ten dollars. Two digits means one thousand, right? Yep. <coughs> I was about to head out. Tyson Sanders stopped me before I got to my car. He said that he knew what I was up to. I asked him how that was possible. He said that I he's seen it before. A young guy joining the mafia because he got nowhere else to go. These guys joined to get revenge on on those who wronged them, and I that, that got them killed. Greg, I don't want you to end up like those guys. People destroyed by revenge and murder. It was wrong for me to try and put that pressure on you like the other like that the other day. But you have to know that the mafia is about business and nothing should be personal. He didn't try to stop me from getting in the car though. He just shook his head and walked away. Who needs him anyways? All I had to do was call in some Goombas to help me take care of Warren. The only problem is, their godfather wants me th th wants to see me, and I don't think it's about Warren. I had to drive to the local, pop the local Papa Jones. The Italians have good taste. I'll give them that. Inside, a couple of goons were waiting for me. They looked like professionals with their suits and slick hair. They brought me into a room in the back. Inside was the fanciest personal booth I have ever seen. There sat a man. No, there sat the godfather. I've heard that his name is Antonio Vito Colombo III, even though some refer to him as Mr. Beardo. Good morning, Hefley. Your arrival pleases me. I kissed the godfather's hand and took a seat beside him. A goon sat beside me, blocking off an exit. The, god the father said that he was glad to hear that I had decided to help out his family business, and that if I had any requests, he would see to it, see it that it, it, see to that it was fulfilled with the expectation exception that I do something for him in return. I requested the use of some of his workers to help me carry out a vengeance on Warren. He was upset to hear vengeance. The Godfather told me the same BS that Tyson said, how he lost his son because of vengeance. However, he said that he wasn't going to stop me because a deal's a deal. He ordered Chad and Jury to come accompany me to Warren's. The Godfather said that it would be easy to get in since he had the guys on the inside working there. All I had to do was mention the Godfather and they let me in. I thanked him and left with the goons. I drove up to Warren's office at the city hall. The place looked heavily guarded with cameras and officers, but Chad said to let him and Jury do the talking. It was around 11.30, which meant he had a half an hour to get into Warren's office before he returns from lunch. Once there, Chad and Jury will pretend to be guards while waiting outside. Inside, I'll be waiting for him with a pistol silencer. We walked up to the front desk. Chad did the talking. Overheard, I overheard him mention the Godfather, and the lady at the desk nodded her head and went off. Later, Chad told me he went... He, me, she went to sabotage the cameras and erase any evidence we were there. Just like that, we were in. I searched around for a couple of guards to break to break, on break and took care of them. After that, Jury and Chad stole their clothes and found Warren's office. Jury and Chad that they said they wait outside, but I have to be the one that takes a shot. It was fine by me. I walked in and turned on the lights. I closed the blinds and turned off the lights. I removed the bulb. I went to sit at his desk. And there I waited, my pistol in my hand. In the pitch black dark, with the only light coming out was from the blinds. All of a sudden, I had a second thoughts about killing this. Killing a boss was killing different from killing just any goon. But I changed my mind when I found his diary on it. On it, he said, Tonight, I'm going to get Chirag's legs to kill that guy, Frank. Also, I've heard this... His... His... Rat son thinks he's in the mafia. Maybe Shirag will send Frankly to kill him. I have no regrets for what I did. On this, on one day, this bitch of a son will have the world and everything in it. That is a promise that I will keep. On the way back from putting one in between Warren's eyes, we drove by the Papa Jones, which reminded Chad to get, to give me something. As I parked the car, Chad took out a briefcase from the trunk. He gave it to me and said that if I ever wanted to truly join the Italians, that I should show up to one of their meetings wearing what was inside the briefcase. I opened it, and inside was a suit that was identical to the one that they were wearing. It was beautiful, but I'll keep it off for now, for old man. Before they left, I still had one question. Who the hell is Shirag? Oh, crap. They told me his full name was Shirag Gupta, leader of the Indian Mafia. He was apparently known to be the most non-violent leader in America. And yet, in Warren's diary, he states otherwise. He also mentions Fragley working for Shirag. If Shirag, if Fragley works for Shirag, then... The Indian Mafia is indirectly, in, indirectly attacking us with Fregley's goons. No, matter, no wonder they were able to take on the mob. I sped back to the estate to tell Alec, Alex Arruda the news, but I was stopped at the gates. A bunch of guys were waiting outside me with Thompsons. I was expecting worse until Tyson walked out of the crowd and tapped on my window. Hey, Greg, we know you, you know what we've been, you've been doing and we want in. You know what the kid's in my basement? Apparently some goons snitched to Tyson about my involvement with the Italians. So Tyson threw that guy's body in the creek and found a bunch of guys who were sick of Alex Aruda treating a bunch of Asian guys in T-Wang or something. Better than his own employees in the home front. They wanted me to be their boss because I had the money to lead. 
Turns out Alex Aruda had made these guys do all kinds of terrible things, like kill kids, blow up hospitals, buy tickets to Endgame, and not show up. He made me frick a cow. What you do with your mom is none of your business. Oh, you got him there. The point was, they wanted Alex gone. And me as the head of the Mafia, I was psyched at first, but then I realized there was only 10 guys out here out of the hundreds of people working for the Mafia. So then I was on board with him taking with taking him out, but we need more manpower in order to do it. So for now, we have to recruit more people on my side before doing anything about Alex. Before I went inside, I asked them why they had Thompsons. In case you declined your offer, same way your dad declined a stronger condom. Damn, Greg. And why is everybody in this like, kind of dicks to everybody? Before I went inside, I went to the estate's graveyard. This place was reserved for people who've impacted and helped the business in ways a normal goon could never do. I walked up to one of the graves at the far edge of the cemetery, where all the fresh ones were dug. I sat next to him. Old man. Yay. How are you doing? Still dead? Alright. He found his body a couple days after the raid. His head was gone, but it was still enough to bury. I wasn't able to attend the funeral because Alex sent me to do a drug deal. It wasn't fair. He couldn't let me go to his damn funeral. I goddamn watched him die. Sometimes I wish like there I feel like there was something I could have done to save him. I wish he was here to help me figure this stuff out. Well, the old man should have would have wanted me to stop Fragley, right? So I guess I'll just tell Alex the news. I asked around where Aruda was. Some guy said he was in his office, so I checked there. I made a mistake. Get out! Get out now! Ooh, Alex, why you stop, Yif? I thought to myself, yep, I think I could do this myself. All was fine until I mentioned him again. Oh, by the way, Fregley called me. Alex, is he leaving or will he Yif too? So apparently, Fregley's been waiting in another town just to come and get me, bitch. Yeah, it's a trap, but this time, I'm gonna trap his trap with an ambush. I got Christopher Brownfield to get out of the... Out to the town where Fragley was waiting. When he asked why he had to go, I told him that it was to prove himself to me or some P.S. Tyson said the only way to get to that town was to take a highway, which means we'd have to go through a toll booth. Apparently we've got guys working there, so all I had to do was make a couple of phone calls so that they were when he mentions that Alex Aruda sent him, they'll let him in for free. It feels like too much. Oh yeah, really? Is that what you said to your boyfriend last night? After that, I sent Chris to, on his merry way to kill Fragley. Also, I got some goons to find out where Shirag will be. I'm gonna see if any of these morons know how to use a sniper a rifle. I was ready to take on the world, but Tyson stepped in and said that it was seemed like I was getting kind of stressed from all this mafia stuff. And if I wanted to go get a drink from the pub, he insists on it. I was down for that. Tyson and I hit the pub after getting something straightened out. It was around 9 p.m., so there were still a lot of people on the street. I honestly can't remember the last time I went out on the streets without carrying a gun. I guess it's just been a while. Once we were there, we found some seats at the bar. Tyson ordered a shot of tequila for both of us. Before we got too shit-faced, I wanted to know more about Tyson. I mean, he's a nice guy, and he more or less was the only friend I got in the business. So how'd you end up in the Mafia? Well, my mom and dad died in a car crash a couple years ago. I ended up in organized crime. When I was asked with a gang, I was when I was with a gang and we found a Mafia guy who asked the simple question of, you guys want a job, man? From that day, we were hired as killers of the Mafia. All my original mates are dead, and I'm the last one. Tyson downed a shot as I asked him what his big dream in life was. He hesitated to tell me, but before he told, before he told, he asked of me to keep a secret. I agreed, but I to take it to my grave. He downed another drink and told me that his big dream was to end organized crimes by means of an underground war. I asked Tyson why someone who makes a career in the Mafia would want it to end. He said that he wasn't even legally allowed to drink, yet he has killed at least 124 people in the last three years. It's a pretty specific number. Greg, we're not even goddamn men, but we have done enough crap to throw us both in prison for life. He said it was already too late for us to turn back, but if he could help any, any others from joining this doomed business by any means, even if it meant war, he'd do it. I asked him what he meant, what, I asked him what people he wanted to rage war, and his response, all of them. Every mafia organization in the world. I was about to protest until something caught my eye on TV. Breaking news, man shot to death at. For a love of God, shoot my head. Yeah, Tuesday. So, yeah, good news and bad news. Good news, Warren's death has gotten Leland in his, Leland his position, so now the mafia has the cops and pol politicians under its belt. Bad news is, Alex Aruda found out about Christopher's death. He also found out that it was I who ditched, dispatched Chris to kill Frankly. A couple of goons came to get to get me this morning. He said that Alex wanted to talk F my life. I talked I walked into Alex's office. He told me to take a seat next to him. When I sat down, a couple of guys with Thompsons came in and locked the doors behind us. Usually Aruda only locks the doors when he wants to kill someone. Well, writing in this means that I didn't get whacked, but you know what? I kinda wish I did after what happened. Alex Aruda told me that he was not angry but sad. 
It was sad that I had taken his friendship and betrayed him by trying to give him a command that was not mine to give. And not only that, but how that betrayal cost the life of one of his men. I tried to explain to him that we could have gotten fraggly if he su succeeded, but he did not want to hear it. Don't lie to me, Halfley, and it insults my intelligence. Look, all I'm saying is if the bullets hadn't killed him, then the diabetes would. Alex said that he likes me, but he had seen my type before. I went up the ranks too quickly for their own good, and they ended up getting too cocky. They ended up crossing the good people who got them there in the first place. He was happy to figure it out before I did the real, real damage. He likes me, however, and he promised that I would not be killed. Yet he had to make sure that this never happened again. Alex Ruda snapped his bleeding fingers, and two big goons came from behind and grabbed my arms. The last thing I remember is Alex Ruda light, lighting a smoke with a smug grim on his face. Nothing personal, Greg. Just business. The goons tied my hands up and led me outside. Once there, one of them ripped my shirt off and started beating me with a baseball bat. If you can still talk, when then we're not even halfway done. Please, stop. Uh, that bat, that wooden bat, I thought it would break at one point and spare me the trouble of a slow death, but it didn't. Every hit felt worse than the one before it. I'd all went by so fast. First, he shrugged my back with multiple blows. Felt like my ribs were going to break, and I tried rolling on my side, but he wouldn't let me. Every time I tried to get up, he'd strike my head, causing me to collapse. I couldn't hear anything besides the ringing in my head and the un un unintelligible words I was trying to say. The bat, that bat, I could still feel it hitting my skull as I write this. If I had a gun, I would have put one in my head before put thinking about putting one in theirs. I blacked out for a second, and the next thing I knew, I was back inside the mansion with a bunch of my followers surrounding me, with Alex Aruda saying something. I think it was, Now that's the story of how this young lad lost his virginity to a cactus. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure that's exactly what he said, but I think I had a concussion, so I don't think I was going to remember what he said. I blacked out again. I heard yelling, and I saw bright lights. Next thing I know, I was in the state hospital. The state had its own hospital because most of the guys here would probably be arrested in under five minutes if they went to a public one. When I finally came to my sentence, I was in a bed with Alex, with Tyson Sanders by my side. Wait, I was fucked by a cactus? Oh goodness, it's worth, worse than I thought. Tyson said that Alex Aruda had came into the lobby with some goons carrying my body, claiming that I was jumped by Frankly's gang. He said that I, I, he had seen something like this before. He was meant to remind the guys that they were still under Alex's protection and without him they were a fair game. I didn't care, I was just glad he was care here. Tyson said that he really saw what really happened and that he would tell the guys right away. But then I got a better idea. What if we tell them that Alex already told them except we changed the respect what Alex already told them except we changed the perspective? Where are you going with this? I told Tyson to not tell the guys the truth, for that would make them fear Alex, knowing that their boss would beat them beat or kill them for even being suspicious. No, I want him to ask the guys why they would why should they stay with Alex if his protection can't even save me, or hire up from a couple gang goons using his own lies against him. Oh, that's pretty smart, man. Old man would be proud. Yeah, I bet he would. That was when I realized the shirt, the one old man gave me, the shirt I was wearing, the shirt that the goons I asked Tyson Terrence to do me a favor before he left the real, to relay the message to the guys. And I asked him for me for him to bring me two things: two so haze I had in the car and a disposable phone. He left and came back with what I asked for. He was about to ask me what was in the suitcase, so I asked him to leave and make sure a bodyguard was stationed at my door. Came back one last time with a gun in his journal, saying that he knows that I like to write stuff in this thing a lot. I thanked him, and Tyson left. Every breath I take feels like a dagger to my lungs. Daggers I hope to one day kill all the people that have put me here. Fragley, Alex, all of them. I will have the world and everything in it. Right now, though, I must focus on surviving. I'm going to put this thing away for now. My hands are starting to cramp up. July, Sunday. It's been a while since I wrote in this thing. Mostly because I've been in the recovery ever since the instant with Alex. Over my entire day changed when my goons came into my room with some important news. Sir, we found him. Don't call me sir. Call me Gragules, Mr. Gragules. Tell me that they were given they were given a lead where Shirag would be tonight. I told them to get a sniper and dismiss them. If I'm gonna take this bastard out, I wanna do it right. I opened up the suitcase and put on the suit. It felt so good. Something I never thought I needed until I got it. If I'm gonna wear such such a magnificent suit though, I need an equally magnificent weapon to go with it. But which to choose? I went down to the armory and picked out a simple yet powerful weapon, a Magnum 715 revolver. This was better than the shit M9 Alex gave me. Just looking in the mirror with this thing along with my suit, this is just the best damn thing ever. I look badass. It looks like how third graders feel when they complete their first mission in Vice City. I know Chase Tyson was joking, but you know what? That's the best feeling in the world. I went outside where my goon and sniper were waiting for me by the car. I made sure my goon got in started the car first as a precaution. 
I've kind of gotten paranoid from the time Tyson placed the car bomb on the truck a while back. The idea of being killed without knowing we were already dead has kind of gotten to me. I don't know why, though. I guess I'll get over it eventually. Hey, Greg are you sure you don't want to drive more? Stop calling me that. Only pricks and epic seven-year-old gamers call themselves stung crap like that. More or less the same people. Cyber Guy Goon. The Sniper Guy Goon hide was kind of weird. He tried not to make eye contact with me and rode shotgun. He's wearing a ski mask, too. I, so I had no idea who he was. That was fine. I thought if he dies, that meant I won't have to know he's, who's actually dead. At least that's what I'm. What I thought. Okay, theory. The sniper's gonna be like Chirag or like Fragley or something like that. So yeah, that's just my theory. Anyway, we left at 11 a.m. The rendezvous point was in the city. The city is the most crime-ridden area. The, just 20 minutes away from Plainview. This place has big buildings and apartments, so most crime and drug deals occur here. Perfect spot for scum like Shirog to meet up. Goon parked the car up near the rendezvous point. The point was apparently on the roof of an apartment near one of the Leland's factories. Goon told me that the sniper knew who the target was, and all I needed was a pair of binoculars to watch his head pop. We were on our way till. Excuse me? So, so what's in your bag? Scram, gringo, you're adopted. While the kids started, the kids started crying and screaming that the scary man with the black face and Scar was going to hurt him. Yeah, that doesn't sound too good, so Cyber decided to commit some good old-fashioned homicide. He pulled out a knife and told me that he was going to carve the kid like a pumpkin. I stopped and told him that we had standards. He yelled at me, saying that if we had the kill live in the evidence, then he, it was evidence that we were here. If we were here, that meant he would be blamed for the death of a mob leader. We're the mafia. Fuck it. Have some morals and be professional. If we let him live, then what kind of animal kills an innocent kid? He was about to protest some more until I flash him with my gun. That got him to shut up. Hey man, put that thing away. I look. I just think that if you if you don't have a set of morals or a limit in the mafia, then you have just as much humanity as the guns we used to kill. Anyways, we made our way to the building. We were up the fire escape all the way to the roof, where I there I could see I where I oh there I we there we could see where Shirog was gonna be one of the Warren one of Warren's buildings. He was supposed to be on the third floor. The building was 400 meters away, so I took out my binoculars and scanned the building. Sure enough, he was there. Wanna guess who was there too? Oh, it's Fragley. Kill him. Shove a ploopy down his throat. Those bastards looked like they were laughing their asses off. I didn't understand why, until, it got, until, until they took a pair, out a pair of their own binoculars. It was then that I realized when my sniper hadn't set up the gun yet, hell, he wasn't even in front of me anymore. That piece of scum was going, going to go for a backstab, like the cowards he worked for. Fortunately, he failed to understand the comments at the oldest time. Don't bring a dumbass to a gunfight. I had a few seconds to react, but a few seconds was enough time for me. I was practicing my quick draw. I got a good look at his face, and I realized it, it, that I realized it was the same goon I had spared a few weeks ago. Frick you, man. This goon was the same freaking human being that I said not to kill. Came back around just to screw me in the ass and get himself killed anyway. The poor fool coughed up some blood and with his last bit of strength he popped the fi me the finger and he collapsed off this falling off the building. This is great. There's just a pedestrian here. I don't get it. Even though I had a gun in his mouth, I think I could have blew his brains out right there, right, th right then and there. I, I didn't because I didn't want him to take the life of someone who had done literally nothing. How's he repay my kinds by literally stabbing, trying to stab me in the back? As I'm writing this, laying in the comfort of my bed, I ponder if the idea of killing the child wasn't as far-fetched as it was at the time. Will that child come back to kill me in the future? No. I shouldn't think like that. Not like him. Anyways, that bastard hit the sidewalk. His head popped open like a ketchup packet. Shirog and Fred must have thought this would happen, because in less than three seconds, a bullet hit right next to my foot. I wasted no time looking for where the bullets came from and made my way down to the building. I passed the street me as I made my getaway. I made my way to the car. The goon asked me what happened to the sniper. I ignored the question and told him that it was a damn setup. A bullet shattered the back window. We turned our heads to see three trucks of goons. One of them popped their heads out the passenger window and started firing. I turned around and yelled and at the dumbass to floor it. If these bastards were going to try and kill me, I want to take a couple with me. Those bastards were gaining on us. They had their better guns and faster wheels, but we had a head start. We drove our way out of the city. Yeah, at that time, I was trying to... So I was down to only three bullets. And I did not want to waste them on freaking goons. That's my goon, goon chimed in with the solution. Hey, boss, I think there's a grenade in the glove compartment. What? Don't you think that's, a, that's important information? I opened the glove compartment. There it was. I'd like to know what the circumstances were for there to be a grenade in it, but I did not care. I was about to reach for it when I... I think one of the goons said to get good because I... I was about to reach for it, but I think one of the goons decided to get good because before I knew it, my goon had a bullet hole in his head. Splat. 
I whipped the blood off my face and tried moving the corpse off to the side so I could get the wheel, but it was already too late. The car came up on a turn, and without the wheel, the car came crashing in a ditch. I grabbed onto my seatbelt and braced for impact as the corpse crashed through the windshield. The car kept on going, only to be stopped by a tree. For some reason, that I can almost assume was the work of God. I was completely unharmed. I got the grenade off the floor and made my way to the road. I saw the top of the ditch and waited for them to become close to come closer. I heard the faint sound of engines got uh, engines get closer and closer until I, that faint sound was like the beating of a drum. I heard a man yell commands at some goons. Fragly, the drum was stopped. Doors opened and footsteps. The sound of a Glock being cocked. It was do or die. Uh, you guys could. I don't know what this is, but yeah. Anyway, the bastard got me in the arm, yet I got in the head. My grenade, uh, I got my grenade over to the cars. I didn't know how powerful exactly this grenade was, but I leave the explosion when something like this, and there's just pit bits of body flying everywhere. When I looked up from the ditch, all I could see were burning bodies and blown up cars on a messed up road. Nothing but corpses, except for one moving living person. This guy was crawling from a flipped car, and it looked like his legs had been crushed by the vehicle. I moved in to get a closer look, and you know who it was? Shirog. I gotta tell you, seeing this worm crawl kind of made me laugh, but he was alive, and I could not allow that to go on. I walked over to the worm with a bleeding arm and an urge to kill. He noticed me and began to cry like a bitch. It was actually kind of insulting that I had to waste a bullet. What the hell are you? I'm a 16-year-old drug dealer who wants to blow your brains out. I'm Greg Hefley. That's who, dumbass, not what. Well, can't the asshole didn't, I can't say the asshole didn't get what was coming to him. But that should have been the best moment of my entire life. But one slow clap had to ruin it all. Turned my attention to the cocky piece of crap. And of course, out of all the people who could have survived the explosion, that cock-sucking ploopy. Fragley came walking behind the flipped car, cocking his Glock. We stood there on, a, on the burning road with the corpse between us. Fragley stood there. He chuckling to himself with his pistol aimed high. Greg, before I kill you, I have one question to ask. Why have, you told, so, why have you devoted so much of your time trying to personally fuck me in the ass? I told him about old man how ever since that day I've been working on this, working to this moment to get revenge. But he didn't see it that way. When I first met you, Greg, you were a pawn in a game that you didn't understand. Now that you've come to face me, but the only thing that's changed then are your coat, the clothes on your back. My hand shook, shook on the trigger. I was about to fire, and told, he told, told me something that makes my hands shake, even as I write this. He chuckled. You're so stupid that you don't even know who rattled, ratted out, old man. I lowered my gun and let out silence. What? I realized that I sounded just like a mouse and yelled, What the hell did you just say? Fregley answered that with a simple question that I had neglected to ask myself in, the whole, whole, in this whole time, them time. Who kidnapped old man in the first place? I had always assumed it was Fregley's goons that had found them. Now that I think about it, how could a couple of goons kidnap one of the heads of Mafia just by finding him? Who did it? Who ratted them out? Sorry, Greg Hefley, but you won't live long enough for that matter. Probably Fragley got ready to duel, his Glock versus my revolver. We stood there, waiting for the other to fire first. Whoever fired first would have to hit the other guy, but if he miss, misses, then they're as good as dead. A few seconds, we stood on the burning road for like an eternity. I turned out the, I turned, tuned out the fire, my thumping hard everything. Once again, it was do or die. My hand cannon got him so badly that he fell over. He was breathing heavily as he put a hand to his gut. He raised his hand to his face and got a sense of what was happening to him. Like a wounded gazelle that just shot and doesn't even know what was happening. Now, like so many of his victims, Fred was on the ground with a hole in his gut. There was no one to save his ass from death. It was over. The end, he knew it too. His eyes said everything for him. He lost. This is a really nice panel. I really like this. Anyway. As I approached him, he looked at me and pointed his pistol at me. You, you missed me. You missed my head. Yeah, tell it to the gaping hole in your chest. I explained to him that the poor bastard that I wasn't going to kill him. After all, I needed him alive for interrogation on who Aunt Laura ratted out old man. He laughed. Then you might as well blow my brains out, because the only person who knows that info was the goon that he gave the location to, and you probably killed him. I pointed my gun at his head. I was ready to finally put his ass in hell. Unfortunately. Click, click. Oh well, somebody hasn't been counting bu their bullets, but I've been counting mine. He got up. That beast got up and laughed. He said that he had one bullet left, and he knew and he knew who he was gonna kill with it. I th I thought that was it. No one was there to save me this time. No last minute mafia raid. No last minute save from one of my goons. It was me against Fragley, and I lost because of one bullet. But I couldn't be killed here. Not when I was so damn close. For once in my miserable, miserable life, I did not feel anger nor pity toward another human being. I felt cold, suffocating fear. I couldn't do anything except wait for him to pull the trigger and put a bullet in my skull. He raised the gun to my head. Something happened. 
something I still think about as I write this. He noticed Shirog's corpse and looked back at me. He lost his grin, replaced by a tired frown, and chuckled and spoke. Oh, cheer up, Greg. Once I'm gone, there'll just be another replacement waiting for me. There's one for all of us. That's the curse of this business. In the end, we are all just pawns, expendable by design. You've earned my respect, and that's why I'm ending this. Damn, who thought that the best advice I'd ever been giving was from Fragley? Either way, I was convinced that I was about to die until Fragley spoke up and said his final words. There's only one way out of this game, and that's a bullet to the head. Oh, and yeah, and he's dead. The sick gun put a the sick frick, the, the sick fuck put a gun to his jaw. I tried to stop him, but I couldn't let the only person to knew who double crossed old man die like this, not without getting a little information, and certainly not by any hand except for mine. But it was already too late. Fragley pulled the trigger, and the hammer struck hot. Hey, wait, no! Bang! I stood there, only being able to watch the man who had helped orchestrate the death of my parents and friend, the man who had tricked me and caused the death of others in the process, the man who had such a hard grip on his town that it caused grown men to cower in fear at the mention of his name. Now it was now nothing, just another corpse on the road. I could hear the sounds of sirens in the distance, probably responding to the smoke emitted from the cars. I didn't care. I just wanted to soak up the moment. I didn't think that Friday's death would ever occur this way. Not like this. He had me at his mercy, even at death. I couldn't even kill him myself. What does that make me? A failure? I still got my revenge, yet I don't feel satisfied because of it. Hell, the whole reason I wanted to get my revenge in the first place was because Fragley killed Old Man. Yet in the process of trying to avenge me, one person I ended up killing more people than I ever wanted to in my entire life. So I just asked myself, was it all worth it? I returned to the estate. The goons at the gate didn't hesitate to let me in, which is a nice surprise. I walked into the building and my goons started swarming me, asking if I needed a medical kit, some water, or a damn vibrator. It was ridiculous. I shoved them away looking for Tyson. He came to my aid and called for a nurse. He sat me down on the sofa and treated my arm. Tyson said he was glad to see me alive. One got turned to street me and the other got his head turned into mashed potatoes. If I had a third that got crippled and I would have uh, have a Thanksgiving plate. And I, he asked what happened to his game. So yeah. Anyway, I told him that I iced Shirog. I didn't tell him about Fragley because he didn't know he didn't know that yet. He was happy to hear that a head leader of the mafia was dead. Tyson thanked me in a suggestion we should celebrate with, with a drink. We made our way to the estate bar. I made my other units leave us as we sat down to enjoy our celeb. Tyson ordered a bottle of tequila for the both of us. I downed three glasses before I even said a word. Tyson asked what was wrong and if I had anything on my mind. To be honest, I was just glad he cared. I told Tyson Sanders about Fragley and how even though he, I got my revenge, I didn't feel like everything was solved. He patted me on the back and said that maybe it was not because I'd gotten revenge and I, I didn't feel fulfilled, but instead because I didn't got re I, I hadn't gotten revenge on everyone who had done me wrong. And you know what? I think he's right. Thinking about revenge, I told Tyson about what Fragley told me before he died, that there was a mole, could be a mole amongst us. He contemplated this. He looked down at his drink and asked if Fragley had given any names. He seemed nervous, sweating a lot and breathing heavily. I asked him if he was alright, and he responded by falling to the floor. He poisoned me. Wait, which one of you is Greg Hefley? Tyson could barely breathe. I could, I, I could not let him die. Not like this. I smashed the bottle and, and yelled up for my goons to get in and apprehend this bastard, but he came prepared. The bastard hit me with a damn frozen condom filled with what I think must have been soda. But I wasn't going to let him, some goon think... That some I was not gonna let some goon that would rather bring this excuse of a weapon to a fight instead of a gun kill me. I embraced him and in doing in doing so I brought the shank to his gut and headbutted him, breaking his nose. Like father like son, you both don't know how to use a condom. Wait, what's a condom? My goons came in and called in nurses for Tyson and beat up the guy who poisoned me. I made sure those guys kept him alive. I wanna make sure he suffers. As for Tyson, I made sure he got to the state ER as quick as possible. The poor guy was foaming and his eyes were bloodshot, but he was alive and that's what mattered. I helped carry Tyson to the operating table, but they cleared us all out so the doctors could operate. I begged the nurses to let me back in, but one of them gave me an attitude. And after all of what has happened today, I really didn't want to hear it from I really didn't want to hear it. Listen, you little bitch. If he flatlines for even one second, I'm going to come to your house, shove your head up your cunt, bend you over and fuck you in the ass. Okay, well, I don't think this video is going to get monetized in the future, but okay. It had been a long day, so I spent the rest of the afternoon in my study, writing in my journal. It helps to calm me down. I fear that I'm losing it, but I have to keep going for them. Wednesday. It's been a few days since Shirog's death. News of a high-ranking mafia boss being killed has spread throughout the crime world. 
It was so dramatic that now that try it all the way back in China, I want to stop working with us, with the fear of this town being too dangerous for business. Do this, Alex Arut has, per has to personally go to China to persuade them to stick with us. He left this morning, saying that he'll be gone for a week. Until he returns, Scotty Douglas will be in charge. You have my orders to publicly castrate anyone who talks about the murder of Shrog Gupta. And you better make the take the pictures of what you cut off if you do. Scotty's just some puppet that Alex used to spy on goons like he doesn't like. I'm pretty sure the little crap stays 50 feet from me at all times. His brother, Evan, is the equivalent of a third grade trying to act like a thug in front of their parents. It was just goons. It's almost too easy. It just doesn't make sense. Why would Alex leave a couple of goons in charge of someone like Leland? I don't care. I don't think it'll even be a problem. Wait, was it a problem or a problem? Just crap. I don't. I. I don't know. I. I, I didn't. If. If only I didn't flunk out of school. All I had to do was make their death seem like an accident, make an amazing speech or some dumb stuff, and went over the favor of the mafia. Hell, judging by the amount of men that came to my aid yesterday, I think a good portion of the mafia works for me. That's not enough. I need someone like Leland on my side to take full control. I was trying to form a plan when I heard a certain someone at my window. So hold up, this guy stole 50 dogs and what with them? Yeah, if you like puppy videos, then I probably shouldn't tell you. I was with Jury, it was with Jury from the, it was Jury from the Italian Mafia. I hadn't seen him for a while, so I was confused to see him at the gates for the estate talking with the gatekeeper. I went down to, ugh, sorry, voice crack, eesh, that was a yawn. I went down to talk. He had some wonderful news to tell me. Due to the death of Shrug, the heads of the Mafia decided to have an emergency meeting here in Plainview. And when I mean here, heads of the Mafia, I don't mean the like Mafia leader in the state. These are the Mafia leaders of their entire country. These people are the highest rung of the, of the ladder. The big boss, to name a few. The head of the Russian Mafia, the head of the English Mafia, the head of the Italian Mafia. Oh yeah, I thought they hate each other. Well, Greg, when someone managed to kill a big leader of the Mafia, that person ends up not being the police and people start pointing fingers. Basically, they were trying to prevent a war. He had to come to get Alex Aru to do the suspicion of surrounding him with his involvement against the local gangs. Apparently, the word was that Chirag had been trying to help the gangs with some BS program that was meant to give them a better education or something. Which I called total BS on. I told Jury to stay where he was. I ran to get Warren's old diary. I had kept it as a trophy. I flipped through it, and sure enough, there was crap in here to make even Harvey Weinstein blush. Not only that, but there were plenty of evidence writing, written this book proving that Shirag used Fregley's hand to indirectly attack the Mafia. And just my luck, the damn fool signed every page that he finished like some grade school wimp. I ran back and showed the journal to Jury. He gagged when he read the part where Warren and Shirag had an orgy with a bunch of... You know what? If someone ever finds this when I'm dead, I don't want them to know my pain. Jury ran to his car and yelled for me to get in with him. He asked me when he, what happened when Al... What, what, what happened... To Alex before we left. Told him that he was either at the airport or at a dog shelter doing things. Where? Hey, jury, by the way, what's in the bag? You see, if Alex Arruda declined to go to the meeting, it, well, I would have had to use persuasion persuasion. This is what I call uh, my rocket launcher. You represent him. You representing him is just as good, though. We sped down to the city and parked next to a big building. A bunch of fancy looking cars in the parking lot being protected by guys who could probably kill me with their bare hands. Jury told me that if I had any weapons or phones, I should leave them in the car. If they found one on me, then my ass would probably end up on someone's mantle. But I wouldn't go into detail about how tightly security was entering the building, but let's just say I know what it's like to be touched by a man. Jeez, that guy was really hard on my balls. Oh, Greg, that guy's a janitor. We made our way into the conference room. There, Mr. Bearder was waiting for us in a lovely chair. I kissed his hand and thanked him for sending Jury. He was confused, though, asking why I was here and not Aruda. Jury explained to him the situation. The godfather looked worried. I asked him if he was all right. He stood up, put his hands on my shoulder, and told me that I was as good as dead. I asked him what he meant by that, and how come I was going to die. Mr. Beardo sat down and told me that the reason they wanted Alex in the first place was to direct the blame towards him. The idea was to get the Mafia leaders to stop pointing fingers at each other and hate Alex. They probably would have beaten him, killed him afterwards, and that probably wouldn't have been the end of that. I'm sorry, Gregory, but these people are angry. They wanted someone to be angry at. But Godfather, who called for this meeting? Mr. Bureau told me to sit down. The meeting was beginning to start. Men and women who carried themselves high came in and filled the seats. Their bodyguards stood close to them. A plus the far end of the table sat an Indian man who looked over well over 50. Once everyone got comfortable and poured some cups of wine, the man addressed himself as Mr. Gupta, Shrug Gupta's father. Mr. Gupta thanked Mr. Bureau for helping to organize the meeting. He grabbed a glass of wine and drank it. He went on and thanked a few others. I would also like to thank Eduardo Malone from the English Mafia, Emilio Mendoza from the Spanish Mafia, No Hills from the German. Hold up, you're not Mr. Hills. 
The German mafia leader ended up being a woman. She looked like she was in her 20s, so she looked out of place with the middle-aged men. Then again, I can't leave, legally drive till next year. My apologies, sir. Well, I can't do a German accent. My apologies. I, I, I'm sorry, I can't. I'm just going to say it normally. My apologies, sir. sir. My water was killed with cyanide the other day. Lord knows who did it, so I came and said it. And you are. Heather Hill is his daughter. Her father, Mr. Hills, was apparently killed in an assassination. She laughed when she said she didn't know who did it. She's one creepy bitch, I'll tell you that. Anyways, Mr. Gupta continued, mentioning the heads of the Russian and French mob. The heads of the Asian mob looked like China and Japan couldn't make it. They had domestic territory disputes and the government involvement. Mr. Gupta drank another glass of wine and got to the point. How could this happen? My own son killed in cold blood on the streets like some dog. Never hurt anyone. Never cheat or kill. He just wanted to help out the young boys and... Uh, and girls of this town. How was he repaid? With his head being blown to bits. Now I have to bury him. My own son. Do you know what it's like for a father to have to bury his child? He wanted about how Chirag came to America to do some good in the world. He didn't want to hurt anyone, so he ha left the mob. He was the kindest guy ever. He was Jesus, blah blah blah. What an amazing lie that was. I was about to say something until he mentioned Alex Aruda. He said that Alex Aruda was practically invisible in the mob and in the mob world. He went on about how Alex Aruda had a motive to kill his son and how his motive was to move up in the mafia ranks by killing a big boss. He called him a coward and he's not wrong. I kind of saw the point he had about Alex until he mentioned Warren. He said that Warren had worked with Shrug to help people and he was killed too. But it was because of Warren's death that they decided to place some, some place high tech cameras in the areas owned by Warren's company that identify any suspicious characters. And just hap just so happens to be some guy with a scar on his head was on the streets running away from something while, ho while holding a gun on the same day Shrug died. I knew where he was going, going with this. Apparently, so did Jerry. Yeah, because he grabbed my arm and told me that I wasn't safe here. I mean, before I probably could have gotten some berate. Baradman for working with Shrug, but I was screwed if they recognized me. We made our way to the door. But then Mr. Gupta finally got to the end of the speech and said that he was glad he finally had Alex Arud in his custody, so he could be apprehended for sending a hit on his son. Hold up! Where the fuck is Alex? Mr. Gupta was first upset at Mr. Buto for failing to bring in Alex Arud. When he got a good look, long look at my scar, he paused, sat down, and shook his head. Well, this is unexpected. I asked for a coward, and instead I got a man who's got the guts to stand before me, killing my son. Jerry whispered in my ear, Crack, did you actually kill his son? I nodded, yes. He put his hand on his forehead and told me that if I wanted to get out of this life, I'd have to explain myself. I walked and I sighed and walked to the table. I poured myself a glass of wine, and I admitted that I killed Shrog Gupta, but not for the reason that they expected. I told them about how the local gangs in Plainview had their existence was proof that Shrog was a liar. For instance, how could a gang be able to take on such a well-organized crime syndicate such as the Mafia. Because of Fragley? No, because they were founded on, uh, is founded and supplied by Shrug's Indian Mafia. The reason why none of them were ever arrested, because Warren had the cops and judges in the pocket. It was the perfect way to storm up, to, to own a town. I drank my glass of wine, letting my words sink in. Some of them started talking to each other, which meant they were thinking. And if they were thinking, that meant they could be in my favor. However, Mr. Gupta said that he was thinking as well, Mr. Gupta was thinking as well and objected to my claims by asking for proof, yet I was two steps ahead and pulled out my trump card. Warren's Diary. Diary of a Corrupt Bastard. Jeff Kinney, 2023. <laughs> the thing that gave it away, though, was Warren's own damn signature at the end of every entry. That man's cursive would even make a doctor confused. Well, at least those orphan girls would be starting a family soon. Miss Hills! The fuck? Not only all the scandals, the indirect mafia tax, it also had the original entry of Warren deciding to send the hit on my parents. Enough of this nonsense. Who the hell are you? What gave you the right to kill my son? I'm a 16-year-old drug dealer who killed your son. I'm Greg Hefley. I'm the reason he's dead, because he fricked with someone who didn't think he would frick him back. That was interesting wording. Mr. Gupta sat and called him over one of his goons. He whispered down something to him and sent him away. He then looked at me and told him to come over, saying he wanted to show me something. He asked if I was into politics. I said yes. He then showed me who was my favorite world leader, and I said the first thing that came to my mind, Donald Trump. He nodded at one of his goons. The bastard nodded back and dialed some someone on his phone. He spoke Hindi. As Mr. Gupta pulled, um, took out a phone of his own, he went onto a website live, live streaming Donald Trump giving a speech. Gupta said that he had met many people like me before. Cocky, young, naive. It was common for him to see. But one thing he had to make sure from them to understand is that they're not talking to a man. They're talking to a god. Oh lord, the president's been shot. He snapped his fingers. A goon came over and punched me in the gut. He punched in the back of my head and grabbed my neck. He leaned in and told me that if I ever raised my voice to him again, my head would be on this wall. That he wasn't just some thug leader of a gang. 
He was the head of the Indian Mafia. He can influence nobodies, become leaders of entire countries. He could do the opposite by making board leaders get taken out. He could even take an extra step and make it as if they never existed enough to begin with. All of that with a snap of his fingers. Listen carefully, Greg. The only reason I don't kill you right here and now is because I don't have to, I have to clean up the mess my son made. I wouldn't want to waste time mopping the blood off a wannabe kingpin off a perfectly good floor. Mr. Beard got upset and told him to let me go. He smirks and released me from his grasp. Fuck me. If I wasn't for the god if it wasn't for the godfather, Goop probably would have popped my head off. I've forgotten what it was like to be below somebody. I staggered to my feet and walked away. Jerry told me that it was time to leave. I didn't argue with him. On our way out, I got a glimpse of that girl, Heather Hills. She was giggling. I was choked out, and that crazy bitch thought it was funny. Those mobsters are fucked up. Before we left the building, Jerry said that he had to use the bathroom. I sat down in the lobby and waiting for him to finish up. While there was, while I was there, I noticed a girl reading a book. I was the only guy there, so I decided to make some small talk. Oh, it's Holly. So, what are you reading? Mein Kampf. Well, I made a mistake talking. Okay, and I, I, I don't know if everybody knows this, but Mein Kampf's the book Hitler wrote. I actually recommend giving it a read. Joking, 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 joking. She laughed and said that she didn't actually like the book. Her sister apparently makes her read this kind of stuff for nationalistic reasons, so I guess she's not Jewish. I shouldn't feel like I may. I feel like I shouldn't make a Nazi joke, but saying Nazi joke doesn't feel right outside. It doesn't sound right. So at least she's not in the KKK. She put the book down and introduced herself. Her name was Holly. I told her my name, and that I was they Greg Heffley, and that I was here for an important meeting. Only laughed and said that she had never heard of a 13-year-old say that you're at an important meeting. I'm 16-year-old in... I'm... What? I'm 16. I'm 16-year-old in I'm mafia meetings? Is that is Jojo? At first, I was angry at this girl for age sharing, but then I thought, holy crap, does she watch Jojo's Bizarre Adventure? I asked her if she did, and Holly said yes. She said that it was one of the only shows that her sister lets her watch. I asked her if she likes part three, because that one's my favorite. But she responded with, there's more than two? So yeah, it turns out her sister only lets her watch part... Two and five, and any fan of JoJo knows that those are those parts have the mob and the Nazis. I want to talk with her more, but a goon came between us and told me to beat it. I slipped her my number and left. I know I'm more than a pawn in all of this, right? I guess it all just comes down to what I choose. I just wish I knew that I knew which choice isn't the one that bites me in the ass. Plus, I could have a chance with Holly. Who knows? Maybe I'll get lucky with her. So we got out of the bathroom, drying his hands on his pants. When we got to the car, I asked him if he could drop me off at the estate, but he had other plans. Drury said that he wanted to talk to me. I told him that any time on the phone would be good. He grabbed my shoulder and said that it had to be now. I tried asking him what he wanted to talk about, but he just kept his eyes on the road. Whatever he had on his mind must have been serious, because he didn't say a word to me the whole car ride. I tried making small talk, but that didn't work either. Well, at least I didn't piss off the, piss off the Russians, am I right? We arrived at Papa John's. We walked inside and sat in a booth. I kind of wanted to see the, that awesome, awesome booth in the back again, but since Jor, but Jor, Jury was acting odd, I didn't mention it. I asked him if I could go up to order, but he stopped me before I could finish. He asked me a not-so-subtle question. In school, were you any, in, in any special ed classes? What? No. Then why are you acting like such a retard? He asked me again, did your mom ever make you want to wear a helmet when you were in grade school? I asked him where he was going with this. Jury shook his head and he said that the stunt I pulled in the meeting was the saddest display of foolishness he had ever seen. I asked him what he meant by sad display. Listen, Greg, have you ever heard of the phrase, a gun and a smile will get you far, but a smile with a gun will get you farther than the gun with a, with a smile? Huh? Sounds like a quote, some, that quote sounds like something off a message board. You got your hairstyle off a message board, dumbass. Yeah, what he meant was that the mafia was more than just guns and gore. Now I was shocked to hear this. I know. He said that I also had to check on territories, drug dealing, weapons dealing, gambling, all that stuff. But I couldn't go around just killing whoever I wanted. I testified that he had wanted to kill a guy like me because of my natural talent and instinct to kill. Instinct to kill. But Jerry said that he wanted a guy who could talk their way out of killing and negotiate. That if I wanted to work with just some killer, they'd just go down the street and hire a psychopath. Moron. I know what I said. Oh, that's a big monologue. <sighs> Moron, I know what I said that day, but you have changed a lot since then. You've become stupid and arrogant, walking around like you have the power to, that you don't actually possess. You haven't lost your edge to kill. In fact, it's gotten worse. What you have lost is your brain to, to kill. Idiot. I haven't seen you do anything pro productive in any way that you, that you since that day, except make enemies. All, of you, all you have done is try to take over a puny tribe, yet you have no investors your back wants to keep you up except us. To make matters worse, you decide if it's a good idea to kill the son of one of the biggest mafia bosses. D don't make me regret what I said to you, Greg, because we do not need another mindless pawn. His only trick is to pull the trigger. 
I hated hearing that word. Like echoes in a cave. It dominated every other sound until it was all I hear. Almost like an instinct. I reached for my revolver. I wasn't going to let this Goomba disrespect me. After everything I've done with him like an Italian. But Jury was two steps ahead. Greg, I've been in this business for a l half my life. I know when somebody's going to pull out a piece. I lied. Saying that I didn't put... I... I lied, saying that I wasn't just putting the gun on the table to show my loyalty. He didn't budge. I placed my revolver on the table, folded my hands, told him that I would do anything for the Italians. He smiled, lowering his pistol, so that I, I, he actually did have something in mind. Jerry said that the Godfather wanted to call in the favor that I had made a while back. It was associated with Leland's power. The favor the Godfather was asking me to do, convinced Leland to work for the Italians. I asked that how that could possibly benefit me. Jerry just shook his head and said that it doesn't. I protested that at first, but Jerry took, shook his head and again and said, that's just how the Mafia works. But wait, he works for us. Sorry, but that's just how the Mafia works. If I lose my chance to personally take control of Leland and just give him to the Godfather, it could mess up my plan. Yet I couldn't risk losing my relations with the Italians. Half the guys who work for me are affiliated with them. After the great conversation, he drove me back to the estate. I wasn't upset that they put me in as this corner, but more impressed. Yet he's right. Diplomacy is the only way I'll be able to take over on the other mobs. Diplomacy is what got me here in the first place, and deep down I know I'm better than them, but unfortunately their guns are bigger than mine. Anyhow, I walked back into the estate. I saw Scotty, Scotty Douglas on the phone, probably talking about how he's a little shit and should eat trash. I got some of my goons to come with me into the basement, because we had some work to do that I couldn't do alone. Work that involved bats and nails. We headed downstairs into the dark underbelly of this estate. I felt my hand against the wall until I felt the familiar shape of a light switch. I then flicked the lights on and got a good look at him. The man who had tried to kill me the other day. The poor fool was tied up and gagged to a table, just like I'd asked. His arms and legs were tied to each other, each tied to a separate leg, with his gut being exposed. I walked up to him, removing his gag, and asked if he was really, re finally willing to comply. He refused. I'll tell you over my dead body. I choose my, I choose my phrase a lot more carefully if I were you, pal. This moron was obviously not going to talk, unless I did something to persuade him. I know Jury told me not to use violence and aggression for every situation. Why not now? I untied his hands from the table so we could sit up. Then I grabbed the chair from the back and asked him if he had a name. He told me to eat a dick. I ignored him and went on. He said, I said to him, very powerful man, and I could make anyone disappear, even the president. I can make Trump disappear. But that's not possible. You don't know what's possible. He said I was bluffing, so I nodded to one of my goons. He caught on to what I was doing and tried to make a phone call. Pretty to show the poor fool the video of Trump being assassinated, and he bought it. I went on how I could make whoever I wanted get sent to hell and more. He hesitated, but he finally gave in. His name was apparently Brent, and it turns out I was his first and probably last target. He's never even used poison before. That explains why he was so bad at it. I asked Brent who hired him, and he told me that it was some goon who worked for Fragley. Apparently, the guy was staying somewhere in the city, waiting for Brent to come back. He told me the address. I thanked him, but he asked if I was going to untie him. I gave him some thought and decided that I wouldn't. What? Why not? We had a deal. I didn't shake on it, so it wasn't official. Sorry. The actual reason I didn't let him leave is because he almost killed Tyson. Plus, it wouldn't be a good message if I let my wannabe assassin get away with trying to kill me. Have you ever heard of a crucifix, Brent? Yeah. Why? Well, I call it inspiration. I called over my goons. One was carrying a hammer. The other was carrying a bu bucket of rusty nails. I felt bad for Brent. He had no motivation to kill me besides money. Maybe I'll let him go if he figures out how to get out of the bathroom of the lake with his hands and feet nailed to a table. Also broken ribs. Did I mention the broken ribs? He's screaming really loud too, getting some attention from the upstairs. Hopefully this will get me a little bit more respect. Sorry about the noise, that guy just really pissed me off. Why, what'd he do? He gave my friend the wrong drink. Oh my god. I made my way to Tyson's room. The medic told me that the Brent gave Tyson cyanide made back in the 70s, so he's gonna have to pull through. Right now, they want him to stay in bed, but that doesn't really stop me from going on, going in and saying hi. Stop by a vending machine and get him some chips. Aruda had one installed to make money off goons. What a jackass. There were a couple nurses telling to Tyson, so I asked him to leave. I needed to talk to him alone. I tossed him the chips. Tyson said he was glad to finally get some real food. I sat in the chair next to him and told Tyson about the meeting. I asked him if he'd be able to accommodate me to get the wise guy who sent the hit on my life. Tyson laughed. Drag, I almost got poisoned to death. I'd like to stay in bed for a while. I chuckled. I told him that he could stay here for as long as he liked. I took a phone out and placed it on the chair. If he needed anything at all, all I, ha all I had to do was call. Greg, I hope you stay safe and use your head. I know. Don't forget to count your bullets this time. Oh, shut up. What a bum. I wrote, rounded up a, a bunch of my goons and said that I had a job for a skilled shooter. Maddox volunteered for it. Maddox was pissed, though. He said he didn't forget the time I ripped him off. Shut him up and give him $1,000. And there, that dollars are in quotations, so... 
I don't know what he actually gave him. I told him to meet me at 7 o'clock tomorrow. Max, Nada, and the rest of them scattered to do some other shit. I know I should be sending another one of these warrants to do this job for me, but this is personal. Besides, how hard could it be? Hold up, is this Monopoly money? Hasbro means 1,000 in Latin or something. Thursday. I bet Maddox at the grounds. He started the car and we hit the road. We got to the apartment in no time flat. The place was a bit run down, so some people gave us a couple weird looks since we were wearing suits. We went inside and took the elevator. Maddox hadn't really said that much up to this point, so I made some small talk. You know, I'm kind of surprised that one of you, none of you guys tried to take out Aruda before, if none of you really liked him. Greg, it's not we couldn't get, we couldn't, it's not we couldn't, Greg, Aruda's smart, heaps smarter people around him, so they feel in power until they outlive them on purpose. It's fucking creepy, man. One of, they got, we got on the right floor and made our way to the room. Brett had sent room 445. We found it and I knocked on the door. I asked if anyone was home, expecting to yell at me something vulgar. Rise and shine and get the hell out. Waited, but nothing happened. I put my gun, my ear to the door. I couldn't make the sound of a chair being, I couldn't, I couldn't make out the sound of a chair. I could make out the sound of a chair being kicked to the floor. When the chair fell, I could make a man gagging from what sounded like a lack of air. It didn't sound good, so I hit the doorknob and broke my way in. What I saw was the sad sum that suicide I'd ever seen in my life. <laughs> the world didn't even tie the news right. Maddox went and apprehended the moron. He had fallen back and was groaning. Fortunately, I was so caught up with the guy on the floor, I didn't realize that it was a decoy. At least I no longer owe Maddox any money. Oh, and Maddox is dead. I dived to the floor and fired two rounds of the guy in the head. He was carrying a submachine gun with a thick suppressor. I got up and wrapped zip-tied over the shocked decoy's hands. He was mumbling some vulgar crap under his breath, but it was mainly because he was scared. Once I fin finished with him, I went over to Maddox, the poor bastard. He couldn't even muster a grunt case because his lungs were torn to bits. He was lying on his back, still alive. I could tell because he looked at me with bare eyes, like a lifeless doll. The color from his face was nowhere to be seen. Instead, it bore a shade of white that only a ghost could have. With his last bits of strength, he mouthed the words, In the head. I understood correctly. I was pissed off now. Not only had I managed to kill one of the, the guys who I who could have known who the rat is, yet now one of my top hitmen is dead. Given, me, given he wasn't smart, but he was a sniper. How many of those can you find just chilling on the street? How... Now I have to escort a guy in a zip tied through a crowd of people who I who just heard gunshots. Frick my life, man. I put my gun to the bastard's head to band to know how he knew he would be here. Point to a telephone dangling off a table. What does a phone have to do with this? Oh my goodness, he called us. He called us and said you'd come. I thought about retracing the call, but heard people coming and I have no idea how, how to do that with a telephone. I had brought a fake police pass which says in case this would happen. I, and I, so I got this goon to his feet and told him that if he said I was a gangster, I would say he was on acid and kill him later. I turned him around, put the revolver to his back, and ordered him to move. A couple of guys came to the door, but I showed my fake badge, and those dumb bastards fell for it. Yeah, this dude got my partner, but I got this too. Make sure no one gets it goes in here. Not even paramedic. They're probably gangsters. Dang. We made our way to the car, and I locked him in the trunk. I needed him alive, mainly because he was the only person who knew what that person sounded like on the telephone. The only way that guy knew we were coming was if the man on the phone was at the briefing last night. Once I got to the estate, I handed him to my goons. He's begging for us to let him go. He confessed right there that the man on the phone sounded exactly like the man who gave him the info about old man. It was also the rat's idea to hide out. They got nervous when they heard that frag we died and that sent that bum assassin. I wanted to blow his brains out right then and there, but I need to help him. I need him to find the rat. My dumbass goons said they. Said they said that it would take a while for them to find the right man. He could have already ran out of town. I didn't care how long it took, I just wanted to know who did it. I don't care how long it takes, I just want to know who the rat is. I went back to my office. I need to schedule a meeting with Leland. I can't show up to his, to, to his office out of the blue. So, I, I was about to dial the phone when I got a call from an unrecognizable number. Picked it up, anyways, anyways and do you know who it was? Hello? New, I, I can't do a German accent, I'm just going to stop trying. It was Holly. She said that she had found this number in her pants. I told her that I was the guy she talked to at the meeting. I asked if she was going, doing anything tonight and if she wanted to have dinner with me. There was a long pause. Then she came back on the phone and said yes. I really dialed for some fancy Italian joint, but they were booked, so I couldn't let a chance like this slip through my fingers. So I called Juria and asked if they could pull some strings to let me in. He wasn't interested in that, though. Jury wanted to know what the, situa the situation with Leland. Greg, this better be about Leland, or I swear to God. In the state of the moment, I might have lied and said that I'd already taken care of it. I mean, I'm going to get it done, just not yet. Dre put me on hold for a while, but he returned and said he got me a spot on Friday at 7 p.m. Everything was going to plan. Friday. I left this morning for Lelands and sped down, I sped to the, down to the city. 
The building I was headed to was the same one I took care of Warren in. I find it weird how we went to the same building for an entirely different reason. I guess that's life. Once I arrived at the building, I went to the receptionist. I had planned the re re pre presentation for Leland and told her I was here to see him, but she asked what business I had with him. I was at, as at that moment that I realized I'd forgot to set up the meeting with him in the first place. I lied. It was for Alex Aruda. She let me in. I thanked her on my way to the elevator. It was easy. A bit too easy. Some of this didn't feel right. Usually they have to check if someone is in a meeting, even if it's for someone like Aruda. Yeah, she just let me right in. Unless she was expecting me to come, but that would mean... No, no, that's not likely. I made my way to Leland's office, and the entrance stood two large men that could have easily turned me into a pretzel nod. However, when I reached for the door, they did not stop me or question what business I had with Leland. It was odd. I opened the door, and there sat Leland, playing what sounded like World of Warcraft on his computer. He told me to take a seat on the chair opposite his desk. How do you do, Gregory of the Heffley of the tribe? Of the how do you do, Gregory of the Heffley tribe? I'm doing amazing, Leland, but what I want to know is how you feel. I asked Leland, and then. I said to Leland that he had an excellent position, potential, as a leader and as a businessman. Man. I told him that there was no reason that he should continue to work with Alex, that he was holding everything down just for his sick kicks. I put my hands on his desk and elaborated how he could become something greater, that, that he could be something professional, something respected. My brother, with a, my brother, why bother with a guy that can barely stand on his, his feet like Alex Aruda when he could, do, in fact, go for business like the Italian mafia? Well, I see. Well, I've heard enough. He snapped his fingers, and two large goons grabbed my arms and, pull, and pull, took me out. The last thing I saw was Leland getting on the phone to make a call. Farewell, noob. The goons tossed me out the building and told me to never come back. I didn't understand it. They usually worked. I think through all the stress and violence, I may have lost my skills. I knew the Italians would have my ass for this, but I thought at the time that's future Greg's problem. Too bad I am future Greg. I headed over to the restaurant at 6.50, where Holly was waiting for me. She's wearing this really nice dress, and I'm going to admit, I felt kind of nervous. Given I have the balls to take on gangs and mob leaders, but trying to impress a woman without drugs is much harder, in my opinion. Oh, crap. I hope my gun isn't showing. Holly and I sat down at our table. A couple of big, tough-looking guys came with us. They sat at the table next to us. Holly apologized, saying that the guys worked for her and her sister. I asked if her sister did that often. She replied that they were new to this area, and I knew this place was dangerous due to the high gang rates. I was in disbelief that a city run by the mob with this little police enforcement could possibly be classified as dangerous. Apparently, her sister was looking for new real estate here in the U.S. of A. Holly looked kind of sad when he mentioned her sister, so I asked her what's wrong. Hey, man, are you all right? I'm fine. It's just my sister. Holly said her sister was very protective of her and wanted the best for her. She rubbed her wrist when she said that, almost if they had been bruised. She was never really allowed to talk to people about the family business, and friends she made were usually just her father's friends. But if they weren't associated with the family business, they were gone the next day. She refused to tell me who her sister was, so I told her that I had some family issues of my own. Though they cannot be, well, they cannot be too bad. My adopted three-year-old brother killed my older brother and joined the Al-Qaeda. She asked if I was joking. I shook my head. She thought about it and said that she uh, and said that she would still wouldn't tell me. I got nervous and told her that I swore on my full mentor that I would not tell a, so a single soul. She hesitated, but when she whispered in my ear, I almost pissed my pants. My sister is Heather Hills. I don't know much about Heather, but I do remember. I do. I knew from the meeting that she was a powerful woman. I remember jury once told me that there was a rumor about that a rumor that Heather held her father to usurp the German media mafia and seize power. No wonder Holly was miserable. The idea that their own family member could off you just to maintain, maintain power? I didn't even want to know what amount of stress that caused her. So we asked her if she wanted to ditch this place to do something fun. She was caught off guard at first, but then she was kind of into it. I ran back to my car to take off my suit until I saw him. It was Rad Chad. I realized the moth must have found out that I lied, and those guys didn't like being lied to. So I took out to the suppressed pistol. So I got my suppressed pistol and hid behind the bushes. I hadn't noticed he hadn't noticed me yet. And since the valet guy wanted what the and since the valet guy want wasn't stopping him, he must have been paid off. It looked like he was placing a bomb under my car. I couldn't kill him. There was too many witnesses inside the restaurant. But I noticed a miracle. Chad's car was in a wide alleyway. I recognized it from when they drove me to the Godfather. I made my way to the car. He had neglected to lock it. It was almost too easy. As I waited for the ru on the rubbery mount of the car, I heard the echoes of the footsteps coming closer. It was Chad returning from his mission. He opened the driver's door, unaware of my presence. I ever so slightly got up to my feet, trying to make as little sound as possible. Chad was on the phone with somebody. He, he irritated that he was the one to do the dirty work. As I clenched the pistol in my hand, talked about my existence as it was some annoying mosquito. A bullet would not satisfy me. 
No, instead I pulled out my belt and wrapped it around his impudent neck and strangled him with all my might. His eyes and tongues bled out as he grasped for life. Chad's attempt to save himself was futile. As the last bits of consciousness crept away like the headlights of a passing car in the darkness, I leaned in and declared, It was a pleasure with working with you, rad Chad. And with that, the gangster was dead. He had this coming ever since the hotel, and it was his mistake to underestimate me a second time. However, he had called up, up hung, hung up the phone, which meant it was time to leave. I met back up with Holly. I, I lied that I had talked with an associate and lost track of time. Then um, I said my car had broken down, but Holly just smiled and took me in her car. So I, I directed her to the town's boardwalk. By the amount of the fun she had, I knew that this must have been Holly's best nights ever. Saturday. This morning, I got a very upsetting phone call. It was from the Italians. Jury and said the Godfather didn't like being lied to, and our friendship was over. I knew this would happen. I couldn't prevent it. However, it's what he said next that pissed me off. The Godfather doesn't want you anywhere near the city. We found Chad's body. You and your goons are to be killed on sight. I just want you to know that I was supposed to kill you, but I declined. Do not expect the same kindness next time we meet. I was so angry that I threw the phone to the wall, destroying it. I didn't need those bastards anymore. I'm the best gangster ever. But I couldn't just tell my goons that I just lost my main source of income. That was the time to act. I gathered a bunch of my goons told them that, uh, to gather all those who were still loyal to Alex Ruda and or Scott. I made sure anyone who was still working for those pieces of scum were either dead or working for me. The five or ten goons were only able to fit in the lobby. I made sure they were all eliminated. I sent Scott to the boiler room. I had a special plan with him. For his brother, however, I made sure he was sent off to the lake. I didn't even want to waste a bullet on him. Just a couple of bricks to his feet and tossed him in. No regrets. Scott was mad. Even with his hands and legs tied to the table, he was screaming that without Aruda, the main triad in China would stop doing business with us. But he doesn't, he know. I have everything under control. And I have some ideas with the casinos. But the goons looked kind of worried. If Scott, as if Scott had a point. I grabbed the Thompson and obliterated his veins. I told him that I, I told him to toss the corpse in the lake. What kind of monster would I be to separate a pair of brothers? Mm-hmm. I left him for my new office. I hadn't really gone into the room since my incident with Alex. That day, he helped open my eyes to how you win in this business. You don't cheat. You bargain. You don't lie. You bend the truth. You don't murder. You eliminate problems. What frankly told me about being a pawn? Well, I've been studying chess, and I've heard that if a pawn is smart enough, they can navigate and eliminate other pieces to become the queen, the most powerful piece on the board. I think that for the first time in a while, I've chosen the right path. Rego's transgender question mark? Well, actually, actually, I actually read a fan fiction like that last week. Make sure you go check it out. I won't get reversible damage. Shameless plug right there. Anyway, sorry. Monday. This morning, I received a voicemail from Alex Aruda. He said some things related to Scott, but he got to the point that he was going to be stuck in China until the end of the summer. Serves the asshole right. That just means I don't have to rush with getting everything. I can relax with Holly and Tyson. This morning, Tyson and I went fishing in the lake today, thanks to the bodies at the bottom, and I knew all the right spots to fish. It was nice to go out and just chill with him, get a couple of drinks and relax. I wasn't that good at it, though. I only let me go fishing once, before Rishi realized that submarines were a thing. Hey, Tyson, you've been in a mafia for a while. Do you ever pick up on what relationship Alex and Old Man had? Tyson said that Alex was taken under the wing of Old Man, saw Alex Aruda's intelligence, and knew he could capitalize. Yet Tyson said that he always noticed that Aruda was taking, taking, was always in the shadow of Old Man, always thinking. What's wrong with the other ones? They're both fine. Those other mob bosses you need to worry about. Tyson asked if I was serious. You have to be joking, Greg. Those people are beyond evil. They would take joy in destroying the whole country and then go to bed like nothing happened. I apologized for what I said and asked them, asked what beef he had with those people. He just didn't answer and me and Ben went back to fishing. I didn't understand why he was so aggressive, but I guess if I just got poisoned by somebody, I'd be mad too. Holly came by later today. The guards went around this time, so it was a bit more relaxed. I told Holly about my rise to power in the mob and told her my plan. I also told I also asked if she wanted to do business with her tribe to help her out her presence and play a few. She was hesitant at first, but she I can't was able to persuade her. But what about Heather? Heather doesn't need to know. As far as she knows, you were able to take control of playing view. I think things are finally going my way. I will have power, money, and sooner or later with Holly, women. Tuesday. Something has come up today, and I'm not sure I want to write about, but I will anyway. A few days ago, I had some assen- I had sent an assassin to take out the Godfather. He also had some special forces to kill Leland. If I want to take over Plainview, I need complete control. All I needed to do is was wait. This morning, while I was making calls to set up pe- meetings with people in Vegas, the goons came in and told me that they found the rat. I immediately got off the phone and grabbed my head and cans cannon. They told me that he was in the basement. I was ready to finally wipe this piece of scum f- face off the earth. I was not ready to see Tyson tied to a chair. What the hell is this? Boss, this is the guy. 
They told me that the goon said Tyson's voice was identical to the one on, heard on the phone a few days ago, and then the voice had told him about old man. I couldn't believe how stupid a guy I would have to be in order to believe that. I was about to put one in the goon's head for making such a mistake, but then Tyson told me he wasn't lying. Tyson was the rat. He told him that I would like everyone who was not me or the man in the chair to please leave the room. I want you to tell me why. Greg, I told you I betrayed old man. I already know, goddamn, what you just told me. I want to know why. Tyson decided to finally elaborate more into his past. He said his parents' death were not accidents, but they were actually the worth of the work of the mafia. The hit was made by old man when Tyson's father couldn't pay them back on a drug deal. So when Tyson was given the order by Alex to rat out the location of old man, he did not skip a beat. As when he met me, however, and realized I had also lost my parents to gangsters, he didn't want me to go the same path of vengeance and violence. Once he realized that I could become something that could stop the mob and end his cycle, he didn't hesitate to do anything within his power to help me rise to the top. Tyson, I gave you my trust. You were my closest friend, and you were paying me by lying to me and trying to use me. It was not supposed to end up like this. You weren't supposed to become like one of them. I had to do it for the greater good. What the fuck do you think I've been trying to do? Greater good? I used to respect you, because you were the only person I could trust. Tyson shook his head. He said that it was beyond his understanding why I cared so much for a man that I only knew for about a week. It was there that I lost it. He was the only hope. Who, he was the only one who gave me hope. The only one who gave me a chance. My parents would treat me like death. Would treat my death like a minor inconvenience. And God knows what Rally would have done. I pointed my gun at his head. He looked down in shame. He said he had no regrets for what he did, but he apologized for giving me the idea that he was truly my friend. I wanted to do it. I didn't care what he did to old man. He lied to my goddamn face and then tried to use me for his own gain. Oh, yeah, sorry, own gain. But for whatever reason, I didn't pull the trigger. But he stepped through my hand cannon at the wall. I was not mad at this bastard for what he had done, but said I was shocked that my best friend was replaced with the scum on earth of the earth human being. I walk. I started walking up the stairs. I didn't look back. I don't want to look at your face anymore. I'll get you a car and a plane. After that, I never want to see you in this town again. Later today, I did just that. I got some of my goons to get him out of the basement and give him a car and a couple thousand dollars. I tossed him the keys. He got in the car and drove away. He didn't notice the remote in my hands. I did what have to be done. It's not my fault he had to face retribution. Yet I feel soon he will have to. F I will have to face mine. For now, I want to put some this somewhere safe, where no one can find it. Tyson, my friend, I fear I'll never see you again, for you have gone to a place I can never follow. Yet I hope one day the Lord can find a way to forgive me. So long, diary, Greg Heffley. Damn. That, that was, I, I really liked that one. That was really good. That was like one hour and 30 minutes, so we're like close to that. So if you guys like that, make sure to like and subscribe. I'm so tired. I'm pretty sure there is a part two to this. So be on the lookout for that. Hopefully out in the, within the next month, like probably in June-ish. I don't know. It's going to be sometime in June where part two is going to be out. So yeah, anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed. This going to be a really long time to read this. A lot of energy. So yeah, anyway, I'm out of here. Bye.